Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. It's good to have you all here today on this Lord's Day. Now, last week we began our study on the book of Acts, chapter 1. And chapter 1 gives us a basic understanding of the Christian life. In Acts, the church is founded, so it's important at the beginning of Acts to outline what the church is supposed to do and how to do it. For some of you, this may be simply a good review, as Richard has said, because you've studied this before. For others, it may be brand new. However, these are important instructions for in Christian living. Victor Hugo was a French poet and novelist. His masterpieces included the novels Les Miserables and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. But he was a great procrastinator. He put off writing to go out socializing. He enjoyed socializing more than he enjoyed writing. His editor threatened to cut off his funding if he didn't finish his book on time. So Victor came up with a unique method. He came up with a method to prevent him from procrastinating. He had his servants strip him and take away his clothes so he couldn't leave the house. He also had them lock him in a room for an appointed period of time so that he could write uninterrupted and not leave the house. Oddly enough, he did finish on time the book entitled The Hunchback of Notre Dame. As a side note, he also, in that book, mentions the corruption of the church in Paris during that time period. Do you procrastinate? What do you need to do to stop procrastinating? And we all have a tendency to procrastinate, don't we? Let's look at our passage for this Lord's Day. We'll look at it together in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. You can open your Bibles and follow along with me. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of heaven? Verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Verse 9, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Verse 10, And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes, verse 11, and said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, the apostles clearly did not quite understand fully what Jesus was there to do. They asked him, now that this is all over with, you've been crucified, you've raised up from the dead, you've come back to us, will you at this time 
restore the kingdom to Israel. They thought Jesus was going to restore Israel, like King David's kingdom, a Jewish state. But this question shows us that they did not fully understand the full scope of the gospel. They showed their lack of understanding. For how many times did Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world? He's not going to overthrow the government, guys. They failed to understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom and could not see past Israel. Even though Christ had told them that his new kingdom, he had told them time and time again, he had told them about his new kingdom. He told them that preaching of the gospel would reach the world and it would reach many tongues and nations. In the coming New Testament era, Christ would rule in the hearts and believers, the hearts of believers in every aspect of their life. If he had come just to restore the kingdom to Israel, that would be like taking a step backwards. Christ came to the earth to move just, not to move just from the kingdom of Israel. He came to the earth to move and create a true new universal kingdom meant for every soul in the coming age. It was to be heaven on earth in the hearts and lives and deeds of men as they were transformed by the power of the gospel. Jesus answers the question that the disciples ask and tells them there will be no date setting about the day of the coming of the Lord. It's not that kind of thing. Establishing his kingdom would take time time in which the disciples and many others who serve the Lord would spread the gospel. Also, knowing the date wouldn't have helped them anyways, especially if they had known that it was thousands of years in the future. They needed to focus on their commission now. Jesus has told his disciples and the followers in Matthew chapter 24, that clearly the date of the Lord's second coming was hidden in the secret will of God the Father, who foreordained all that comes to pass. Only God the Father knows. Matthew 24 verse 36 is worded almost exactly the same as Mark 13 32. Listen to this. In Mark 13 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. No one knows, not even the Son. Even Jesus doesn't know. He goes on to say in verse 33, be on your guard, be, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. What Christ meant when answering them was that this would be their time, a time for witnessing for the gospel. Also, this time, the scope of their witness was not just Israel, but the world. Verse 8 sums up the book of Acts. It begins with the Holy Spirit's power that drives the witness for Christ, then provides a rough outline for the book. From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The statement, you will receive power, means the Holy Spirit will be at work in the lives of these ordinary men. The powerful work of the Holy Spirit after Pentecost brought about several beneficial results. Effectiveness in witnessing and ministry while proclaiming the gospel. Power over sin and Satan and demonic forces. Also a wide distribution of gifts. The disciples would have understood that the word power meant the power to preach the gospel effectively 
also the power to work miracles, transforming the message by the Holy Spirit. Christ, Christ's followers would be equipped for the task. They would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The implication is that once the Holy Spirit came upon the church, he would always remain to empower the true New Testament church. The church would never be left alone to act on her own strength. She would be able to follow the clear leading and working of the Holy Spirit. Also, when verse 8 states, you will be my witnesses, we are all to be witnesses for Christ, to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, powered by the Spirit. This is not to be a political movement in Israel. It was to be an evangelical movement to the world that would bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Quoting Isaiah 49, 6b, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Or as it says in Acts 13, 47, so the Lord has commanded us saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. See, we have a lot of work to do, don't we? As Calvin put it, you must fight before you can hope to triumph. Witnessing for Christ is, is costly and, and sacrificial. Let me explain. You see the word witness in verse 8. In the Greek, the word witness is martyr. M-A-R-T-U-R. -R. The root origin of the English word martyr. Now, all 12 disciples except John were martyred. John was the only one who lived and died of natural causes. He was banished by the Roman emperor to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote Revelation. What I'm trying to say is, we will have to put up with some resistance, some pushback, and criticism. Also, maybe one day we'll have to sacrifice our lives. Witnessing for Christ is not easy. If Jesus' disciples had to die for the cause, why would we expect anything different? There's also a geological reference in verse 8. From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Thomas went to India and China. Andrew traveled to Russia, Turkey, Greece. Philip went to North Africa and Asia Minor. Peter to Palestine and Asia Minor. James, the son of Zebedee, proceeded to Spain. John went to the church in Ephesus that was founded by Paul and then the Isle of Patmos. Bartholomew journeyed to Ethiopia, Iran and Turkey and Armenia. Matthew went to Judea and Ethiopia and Persia. James the Lesser traveled to Spain and back to Jerusalem. Thaddeus went to Judea, Samaria, southwest Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Libya, with Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot went to Egypt, then joined Thaddeus. Matthias, he ventured into the interior of Ethiopia. Just like the song, men rise up and make her great. They rose up and they went to the ends of the earth to make the church great, to spread the gospel of Christ. Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous American architect, was once commissioned by a wealthy Pittsburgh businessman, Edgar Kaufman Sr. He was to create Falling Water, a beautiful house in rural Pennsylvania in 1934. After visiting the site, he told Kaufman, 
He had been working on plans, but he was procrastinating. He had not actually drawn anything. So imagine Mr. Wright's surprise when Coughlin called him early one morning and said that he'd be up there before lunch to see the progress of his plan. Wright frantically drew up some plans in the time it took Kaufman to drive up from Pittsburgh. He barely finished in time. And when Mr. Kaufman arrived, he was impressed with what he saw. And Falling Water is now listed as a National Historic Landmark. Frank Lloyd Wright design, designed his most famous house at the age of 67 in just two hours. He procrastinated, and he got lucky this time. We can't procrastinate with the commission Christ gave us. Has your procrastination ever paid off like Mr. Wright's? Probably not. Why do we procrastinate? Why do we put off what we can do today for another time? What if Christ had procrastinated after his resurrection? What if Christ hid for 40 days? Ah, but Christ did not hide after his resurrection. He made several appearances after that. They were deliberate and purposeful visits. Here at what would be called later the Ascension was his final appearance to the disciples. It marks the end of his 40 days with the disciples. Pentecost would follow 10 days later. Jesus, therefore, departed in such a manner to convey finality. Even though it was not a permanent goodbye, it was more like, I'll see you later. As the disciples stood there looking up into heaven, two messengers from heaven appeared to tell them, Jesus would return from heaven in the same way that he had just departed. What I find is most striking was the initial question of these angels. It sounds kind of like they're scolding the apostles just a little bit for being amazed at what just happened. Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into heaven? It seems hardly a fair question. After all, if the pastor of a church rose through the ceiling at the end of the sermon, we would all be inclined to look up in amazement, wouldn't we? So, what's the importance of this question? To me, it seems to be the application of the ascension itself. Christ ascended into heaven, and the message would be, time to go to work, guys. The disciples were confirmed in their calling to be Christ's witnesses. They need to go to work now. Christ's departure into heaven signals the immediate start of their great commission to preach Christ throughout the world. So why are we standing here gawking, guys? Let's go to work. The angel's questions and statement prompts the disciples to start the work that the Lord gave them to do. Stop looking up into heaven. It's inappropriate. He will come again in the same way he left. It will be a worldwide huge event. No one will miss it. So being assured of that fact, don't spend your time looking into heaven. Don't spend your life worrying about the end and when the end will come. Set your eyes upon the work that he has given you you to do. This challenge ought to be ringing in our ears as freshly as in the moment when it was first uttered. Yet often we see Christians looking skyward. Sky watching seems to be a favorite thing of Christians. They keep looking for the second coming. Have you heard what's happened in the Middle East? I'm sure that's a sign of the end times. Look at how bad the weather has been. It's never used to be this bad. I'm sure that's a sign of the end times. Even though Jesus has expressly forbidden such specu speculations. Look at all the false prophets that litter our past. 
All this brings disgrace to the gospel. The Christians that gaze ever skyward for fresher insights for the second coming, they disgrace the gospel. While they're doing that, the world perishes for the lack of a real Christian witness. Come on, people. We all know we're living in the end times. We've been living in the end times since the first century. Let's stop watching for signs and get to work and do our jobs. The point I'm trying to make is that we don't need to be actively looking for signs of the end time. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a reality now. We are all supposed to be witnessing for Christ. Let's stop procrastinating and get to work. Let's work together and spread the gospel to the world. We are all one body in Christ's church. And I think Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we are all baptized in one body. Jews and Greeks, slave or free, we are all made to drink one spirit. The Holy Spirit is now with us and will be with us no matter what we do. He will guide us daily to be witnesses for Christ. There's no reason to procrastinate. There's no reason to fear. There's nothing to fear. Let's get to work. Are you ready to witness for Christ? Have you confirmed your calling to be a witness for Christ? Are you ready to share the message of the gospel? Leonardo da Vinci is known today as a genius of the Italian Renaissance. However, during his lifetime, he had a reputation as, guess what, a procrastinator and a daydreamer. He hardly finished anything. It said that he was a man of incredible talent. He was talented in both the arts and the sciences. He contributed to engineering, architecture, math, physics. He sculpted, he painted both portraits and murals and made plans for ingenious machines that wouldn't be built in his lifetime. Planes, helicopters, submarines. But he never finished a project on time. He was a procrastinator. He was easily distracted. His talents and energies were often wasted on doodles and unfinished projects. Believe it or not, it took him 16 years to complete his most famous work, The Mona Lisa. 16 years on one painting. Leonardo said in his later years that he regretted never having completed a single work. He appealed to God, tell me if anything ever was done. Tell me if I ever completed anything. When he died in France, in 1519, he left numerous sketches for unfinished projects. Why do we procrastinate? Is it just human nature? Are we afraid of the unknown? Are we afraid of failure? Now, we know what needs to be done. Why are we wasting time? Christ gave us our commission when he gave the apostles their commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. Jesus gave this command to the apostles shortly before he ascended, ascended into heaven. And it essentially outlines what Jesus expects his disciples and those who follow them to do in his absence. It's interesting that the, in the original Greek, and I was looking at this the other day, the only direct command in that verse is make disciples. The Great Commission instructs us to make disciples while we're going throughout the world. The instructions to go, 
baptize and teach are indirect commands. How are we to make disciples? By baptizing them and teaching them all that Jesus commanded us to do. Make disciples is the primary command of the Great Commission. Going, baptizing, teaching are all means by which we fulfill the command to make disciples. A disciple is someone who receives instructions from another person. A Christian disciple is a baptized follower of Christ, one who believes in the teaching of Christ. A disciple of Christ imitates Jesus, example, clings to his sacrifice, believes in his resurrection, possesses the Holy Spirit, and lives to do his work. The command, make disciples, means teach or train people to follow and obey Christ. Acts 1 verse 8 is a part of that great commission as well. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are to be Christ's witnesses, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Witnessing in our cities, like the disciples did in Jerusalem. Witnessing in our states and countries, like the disciples did in Judea and Samaria. Witnessing anywhere else God sends us unto the ends of the earth, making disciples. Today we are ambassadors of Christ, and we plead on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. We have received a precious gift. The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude 1.3 Jesus' words in the Great Commission reveal the heart of God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 The Great Commission compels us to share the good news until everyone has heard. Since we have received the power of the Holy Spirit like a good servant of God, we should be about our Father's business until Christ returns. The Holy Spirit in man is God, indestructible and faithful and eternal. However, man himself is inferior, divisive, deceitful, and totally depraved. Without the Holy Spirit, man hungers for flesh and worldly pleasure. With the Holy Spirit, man can be a true servant of Christ, bringing glory to God's name helping his brother in need, witnessing and evangelizing to the world, and spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is what it means to be a mature Christian. Have you died with Christ? Does Christ live in you? Do you have faith? Again, I think Paul said it best in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're not living for Christ, if you have not died with Christ, in other words, if you have not died to yourself, if you are not living by faith in Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you, then you're only living for yourself. And you will die in your sin. You will spend eternity in darkness, devoid of God, in the fiery lake of hell. Turn your face, turn and face the truth, repent and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Well, there's one 
last thing I want to I want you to consider. This is kind of something I thought of the other day. How does that oak tree stand for hundreds and hundreds of years? How does that oak tree survive wind and rain and storm and flood? That oak tree stands firm because it has deep roots that no one can see on the surface. Yet, they're still there nonetheless. They feed and nourish and give the tree strength just as the Holy Spirit in man. He's always with us. You may not always see him, yet he is there nonetheless. He feeds us and nourish, nourishes us and gives us strength. How do we witness for Christ? How do we have the strength to do so? How do we withstand storm and flood and trial and tribulation? How did Paul withstand all the time he spent in jail for Christ? He had deep roots. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Holy Spirit gave him strength and guided him daily. Paul was able to do all things that he was instructed to do because he had faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit was with him daily. Can we be like Christ? We might not match his strength. However, we can be just as committed as he is. He was. Do you have that commitment? Do you have that commitment? Are you ready to go and make disciples of all nations? Are you ready to start teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded us? Remembering that he is with us always to the end of the age. Let us bow our heads, loved ones, in prayer. Father, holy and sacred is your name. Help us to never forget that. Father, thank you for sending your Son to be our propitiation for sin. Father, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to indwell us and guide us daily. May we listen to him. Your Son, Jesus, told us to go, therefore, and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us to do. Father, I pray for strength to do this. Those of us who are Christians here in this room today, and those who are listening, help us do this. And doing this, we will re-energize ourselves. Help us to re-energize ourselves by doing just that to affect a real change in this world. We know we cannot weather the storms of life on our own. We need your power and strength to face each and every one. To those who do not know the power of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, turn away from your sin, repent and pray to Christ for forgiveness. Ask for the Holy Spirit's power and strength to weather life storms, to help you patiently endure hard times. Turn to Christ now. We pray that you will do this. Learn to trust in him as we all should. In our Lord Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.